Let's turn now for our scripture reading to an earlier part of that passage that we read in Ephesians 2 earlier. We're going to read here now the uh, Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 7 from which Elia will be preaching. Ephesians 2 verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We'll now wait on Elia for leading in the meditation on his word this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to everybody. And uh, this morning, our scripture reading, our scripture for our sermon is from Ephesians chapter 2 as read and uh, we will turn there and then before we start studying meditating we will be uh, let's let's uh, ask God his mercy let's pray let's bow down dear merciful and holy God We thank you for this grace you have poured upon us and we praise you because you are the only one to be praised and we worship you because you are the only one in this entire universe to be worshipped. Lord, I ask through your Holy Spirit open our hearts, minds and ears to your eternal word and eternal truth that we may understand and apply your word daily in our lives. In Christ's gracious name I ask, amen. As we have already read the text from Ephesians chapter uh, 2, uh, though we read from um, verses, actually we read the whole chapter. So uh, then you know the context, what's going on there. And uh, our main focus today, this morning, will be upon verses uh, 4 through 7. And uh, we will go through each verse and we will learn this morning God's precious word. In our days... Some Bible teachers and Christians tell that that the man is spiritually sick and Christ has provided a remedy in the corner drugstore. And we must drag ourselves there and take the medicine and so regain our health. However, the Bible tells sinners that they are not just sick, but they are dead. They need to be resurrected, not just to regain their health. Because no medicine in a drugstore ever brought a dead man back to life. I haven't seen any. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen, and I I am sure. Nobody. That's what the first three verses 
of our text, three verses of chapter 2, which we read, they talk about, they, they present a hopeless humanity. The humanity that is trapped in sin, under Satan's power, and unable to save itself. The opening verses of Ephesians chapter 2, three, these three verses describe the dreadful condition of those who are unsaved. And Satan, and they are under Satan and, it is in, and their world systems actually keep them constantly in the state of deception. The flesh, mind, and will of a lost sinner have all been affected by sin. That's what these three verses of the chapter they talk about. This lost sinner, the lost sinners, they may try, try as they might, all their attempts at religious activities and self-improvement can never make them right with God. Suppose you are homeless and somebody befriended you in the town and offered, offered to buy you a big, beautiful house and told you that you could choose the house you wanted. Wonderful. Then when he, uh, when he was handing you the title deed, you reached in your pocket and pulled out two pennies. And even when you reached down in your pocket to pick, pick, pick those uh, uh, pennies out and put them in your friend's hand, those pennies slipped from your hand. They, they, they fell off from your hand. And they fell in the mud. You then reached down and picked them up and put them into your friend's hand, those pennies with mud. And you told your friend, you told him this house is too big of a gift for me. Therefore, I must help pay for it. You know what you are doing? You are insulting him. And likewise, we insult Christ when we try to add our filthy rags of righteousness to his precious gift of salvation. That's why I said we are dead and in sin and cannot help ourselves. The help, helpless humanity that is presented in these three verses. Nothing, man, nothing can make a sinner fit for, he, fit, fit for heaven. Left alone, the lost sinner will never become holy or seek God and escape the fire of hell. In that, day, in that dead, deceived, doomed uh, situation and condition, they are separated from God and they are doomed to face God one day, God's judgment one day. The present condition and the future condemnation of the lost sinner could not be stated in any more horrible uh, terms than in, the, in, in our text in these three verses here. That's where the lost person is today. And we are to remember that that's where we were today at one time. That's where I was one day. But now, what that dead, deceived, depraved, and doomed sinner need? They need divine intervention. They need divine intervention. That is exactly what the, 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 the passage before us describes in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 7. That is exactly what I want you to understand today is that salvation is of the Lord. Jonah chapter 2 verse 9. It does not, it is not the product or result of our own efforts or improvement. 
God Almighty personally invades the dead and alien heart of the lost sinner and cause it to become a living saint by his amazing and life-changing grace. That's what I want, you, I want to examine with you, and I want you to examine this morning our text and subject under two, uh, two points, not three this time, two. You might be thinking the sermon will be shorter. Maybe not. And these two points are and will be divine intervention and divine identification. And then these two, under these points, there are exactly the same uh, sub subheadings or sub points. And the first, in, in first point, under first point, there are three aspects of interventions. And under second point, there would be three areas of divine identification. And we will look from our text. Three aspects of divine intervention and three areas of divine identification. Let us turn to our first point. Let me read again. Uh, that, is, that is based on verses 4 and the first part of uh, verse 5. 4 through 5a, divine intervention. Let me read it again. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions. Let me stop here. We will cover this point uh, in, in this verse. It is text. Verse 4a, verse 4 begins with two mighty antithetical words. Do you know what they are? Very simple, very little. Six word, six little word letters what they are but God. They are two mighty antithetical words. These two words compare the uh, desperate state of fallen humankind and uh, the gracious initiative of sovereign action. They tell us that we are objects of the wrath, but God had great mercy upon us. These two words tell us we were slave in, in, in a situation and, and a situation of dishonor and, and powerlessness, but God has raised us, uh, raised us with Christ. Thus God has taken action to reverse our, uh, that desperate condition, condition in sin. And it is very essential to hold both parts of this contrast in verses 1 to 3 and uh, verse, uh, from, uh, verses 4 through 7. It, it is very important to hold those both parts of this contrast together, namely what we are by nature and what we are by grace. The human condition and the divine compassion God's wrath and God's love. Again, these two words, small words, but God. These two words are also filled with great glory, power, and meaning. These two words, just six little letters, that are, as I mentioned, one conjunctions and one personal noun may just be the greatest words in the Bible. These two words tell us where, where salvation originates. What is the source of our salvation? And the answer is, it originates in the person of God. And then these two words tell us, uh, tell us who initiates the salvation, where it originated, and who initiates that. The answer we find there is God always makes the first move in our salvation because the lost sinner is incapable of making the first move toward God. That's the truth revealed in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We loved, you would say, yes, we loved, 
But read next, next phrase. We loved because he first loved us. Also John writes in his gospel, John chapter 6 verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So it is God who, 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 who initiates the first step, moved down, came to us. Not only that, these two words, these little two words, mark the difference between life and death as well. Between a life of turmoil and a life of peace. Between the salvation and damnation and between heaven and hell. That's why I said these two little uh, antithetical words are very important. Take a moment to, to contrast the truths of verses, first three verses and these two words. Contrast. Read the first three verses carefully and then and meditate on these two words. But God. Take a moment to look yourself and see where the personal interventions of God made an eternal difference in your own life, in your family life, in your friend's life, and in your church life. Praise God, he took a personal interest in me, and he did. And we, last last time we, we uh, last Lord's Day we studied about uh, 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 testimony of saint and we praise God he took the initiative and personal interest in me and in you and in everybody's life who who is in Christ and I bless the day he came called called me as his son I'm sure I wasn't I wasn't looking for a divine savior as I have earlier mentioned I was spending more time reciting rosary, paying church for my own salvation. I wasn't looking for a great and glorious savior in Christ. Praise and thank to his personal intervention, I am saved. What about you? What about you? Can you praise him for his personal, his, his personally intervening in your own life? He did. He did. Let us move on. So he, we, we saw that his, his, his intervention is personal. He personally moved. He personally came. He personally sent his son. And God's intervention is not only personal, it is a precious inter intervention. Let's look at the second part of verse uh, 4b. God's intervention is personal and God's intervention is, is, is precious. Let me read again the whole verse. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he has loved us, with which he has loved us, we looked at the, these two words, but God, and now look at next phrase. What is that? Being rich in mercy. God who is rich in mercy. Let's take, take a moment to think about what Paul is talking about here, what he is saying here. He mentioned that the, the fact that God is rich in mercy. It's a simple phrase again. Just maybe uh, three words. But this verse, especially the rich, uh, the word rich, it is a repetitive theme in the epistle. Uh, if you look at uh, chapter 1, verse 7, you will see there, uh, Paul says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to what? according to the riches of his grace. The word rich or riches appears six times in, 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 in the whole epistle there, again and again, almost in every chapter. So that's why I said it is a repetitive theme. God's intervention is precious. The word rich refers to an 
over abundance that which is without measure or unlimited this characteristics suggest that god possesses an over abundant measureless and unlimited quantity of mercy again in verse in in in, in verses 5 and 6 a uh, 5 and 8 if you look the same theme is repeated in verses 5 and 8 uh, uh, the same assertion is made and same theme is repeated by the phrase by the grace you have been saved so we are saved by his great grace and mercy if you group together these verses 4 through 10 if we they are grouped together and they are then they become an inspired psalm celebrating the glories of salvation and of sola gratia It's grace alone if you look at uh, group together these verses 4 uh, through 10 that means our savior jesus christ if you look at his life if you read his life in in in, in gospels when you look at his life and in the ministry his life is and ministry is marked by his mercy which he when he walked on the earth he was so gracious he was so merciful many times the bible says that he was moved with compassion like in matthew chapter 9 verse verse 36 it says when he saw the crowds he he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without shepherd isn't it it's not only one time many times in his whole life actually he came down because of his own mercy because of his mercy as he looked upon those who were helpless in the affliction and their sins our savior lord jesus christ on those occasion the savior's mercy moved him to reach out uh, reach out in love and mercy the lord's mercy for sinner flow out a uh, flow out of his love from his love and jesus assured his disciples as well he also offered his mercy to others he was compassionate compassionate to the crowd and also he, he he assured his disciple of his precious love in John chapter 15 verse 9 he told them those are very interesting and very important word of Jesus he wanted to assure them he said just as the father has loved me i have also loved you abide in me amazing the same love the father loved with loved christ and the same love with same love he loved his disciple and he loved us he poured mercy upon us isn't that precious mercy isn't that precious intervention of christ is god that is a precious love of christ and precious intervention of uh, god in his son lord jesus christ and we saw that god's intervention is personal it is precious let's move on and move to next verse verse 5 and the first part 5a god's intervention is personal precious and now god's intervention is also profound in verse 5a let me read again even when we were dead in our transgressions made alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved notice when god's or divine intervention happened or occurred what is the time when god's intervention occurred in verse 5 according to verse 5 when even when we were dead in our transgressions in our trespasses in our sins that is the exactly is that time 
So God, uh, of course, in his uh, redemptive uh, covenant, uh, covenant of redemption from the eternity. But here, especially in our text says, when we were dead in our transgressions. God did not wait until we improved our condition. He did not wait. He did not wait until we got better. And he even did not wait until I joined RPCNA. No. He set his love on us while we were still dead in our trespasses, in our sins. He loved us in spite of our wickedness. That is the time. He reached down to us when he knew that we could not and would not reach up to, toward him or to him. That is time. He knew that. That's verses 4 and 5a answers actually very three crucial questions regarding our salvation. These two verses, or one and a half verse, they, they answer very important three crucial questions regarding our salvation. The first one is simply like that, why God made us alive? And the answer we saw that, that because of his nature. Because he's merciful God. The second and second question and the answer is like that. When, why God made us alive and then when God made us alive? The simple answer is when we were dead in our sin. And the third question is how God made us alive? By grace alone and through Christ alone. By grace alone and through Christ alone. As I said in verse four, 5 and verse 8, the same phrase is occurred. It's, it's repeated there. You are saved by grace alone. And when we are placed in Christ, we become the exact opposite of what we were before. Can you tell that? Do you know that? Everything changes. And it changes forever. Permanently. The status is changed. That isn't that profound? And thank God for his power, personal, precious, and profound intervention that he came to us. He showered his mercy upon us. He personally came to me. He personally knew me. And we saw that God's intervention, how precious, how personal and precious and profound is that. Praise God for that. Now let us turn to our second point. We saw in the second, uh, first point that God's uh, divine, inter, uh, divine intervention, and we will turn next to uh, in verses 5a and 6, divine identification. Let me read again these two verses, 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in our transgress transgressions, uh, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not only God intervened in our lives by loving and saving us from our lost condition. Not only that, he also identifies with his son those who are redeemed. Wow, okay, you are saved, and then, then you, you just stay there. Now, he's united. He identifies us. In other words, when God looks upon us, he sees us just as we are in Jesus Christ, not as we were before, uh, before Christ. He doesn't see our sin anymore. We read that text last time. He has thrown our sin behind his back. He does not see our sins, but he sees as we are in Jesus Christ. 
He sees as Jesus Christ is. He changed our relationship with Jesus Christ. In our sins, we were separated from him, as we have also read in verses uh, 11 and 12. Before we were united to Christ, what was our condition? Let me read again verses 11 and the context of our text, immediate context, 11 and 12. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles, in the, in, in, in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human, human hands. Remember that you were at the, at the time separated from God, Christ, it, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. I should read uh, only verse uh, 12. Yeah, we were separated. We were separated from Christ. But in grace, we are now placed in a vital relationship with, 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 with him. And that is what the next uh, two verses says in verses uh, 14 and uh, 13 and 14. But now, in Christ Jesus, who formerly were far away, far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups, both groups into one and broke down the barriers of dividing wall. Now here is the condition before and after. Picture before and after. Total transformation. Also notice three propositions in our text, verse, chapter, uh, verse 5, 6, and 7. Those three propositions are with Christ, in Christ, and again in verse 7, in Christ. Verse 5, with Christ, verse 6, in Christ, and again um, uh, verse 7, in Christ. Some translations say, uh, say it's with Christ again there. What is now true of Jesus Christ is true of all of those who are in Jesus Christ. If you are in Jesus Christ, that is true of you. You were far off, but you have brought near. We have united with Christ. He has brought us close to Christ. And this passage speaks of at least three areas in which uh, God has redeemed, uh, uh, God's redeemed people are identified with Christ. There are three areas. As we saw three aspects, now we will look at uh, three areas. How God has identified us with Christ. How we are identified with Christ. Let's look again at verse 5b. Verse 5b. made alive to, to gather with him. Even when we were dead in our trans, transgressions, made alive together with Christ. We are made together uh, alive. That means, that talk about resurrections. We are resurrected. The resurrection is not just a future thing happens. Of course, there would be a resurrection of dead, all dead, but many dispensationalists, they think only about that. The resurrection is not something that will happen in the future. Yeah, of course not. But saints are already made alive. We are resurrected with him. That means we are passed from death unto life. And we are already met the, met the resurrection and, and the life. If you are, if you believe, and if you live that life, as a result, if you live that, if you believe that, what should we be doing? We should be living in Christ, living for Christ, because we are made alive in him or with him. 
Paul reminds us that truth in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, uh, this way. I have been crucified with Christ, and, the, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave me himself up for me. We are identified with him in his resurrection. So we are, when, we, when God made us alive or we are resurrected, he marked a very significance in our lives. He marked a, a, a significance and difference. The difference between the sinner and the saint, unbeliever and believer, but what is that difference look like? What should it look, look like? Did God change any certain faculties in believers that unbelievers lack? Did he change our, our, our brain? Did God change our brain? Did he give a new brain to us? No. Nor any intelligence or anything else. But what he did, what happened, these human faculties, they always had been there. They've been our servants and members of our instruments of our body and our part. What is new? What happened? What is new? Uh, it, it is a new bent. And it is called new disposition. Because we are made alive with him, there is a new power working in us and guiding our, our, our faculties in a new direction. That is leading our mind, leading our conscious, leading our body, because we share his life, because he is living in us, it means that tomorrow does not uh, have to be uh, like yesterday. He changed everything, and he changed permanently. We have been empowered to live now lives of, uh, of new creatures for his own glory. That's what it means when we are identified uh, with him in his resurrection. And secondly, we are identified with him in his ascension. Uh, verse 6 talk, uh, talks about that. We are identified in his resurrection and we are identified in his uh, ascension as well. And raised us up with him. Let me stop here. This phrase can sometimes mean resurrection, but here in this text it does not. We have already talked about resurrection. This expression raised up in our text in Greek and even in this context, it does not mean just resurrection. Sometimes it can, and it is used. However, here the words are not meant resurrection, but the phrase refers to Christ's ascension back into heaven. Do we remember uh, 40 days after uh, Jesus was uh, uh, raised, uh, Jesus was resurrected? He was ascended into, the, into heaven. We saw that we, we are, we already saw that we are made alive and now, and we have been given a new disposition, new bent, not new brain. And now we are being raised, that means, or taken up. We are raised, taken up with, with, with Christ in heaven. I'm not talking about the fallacious doctrine of uh, rapture. That's not. It doesn't mean that there. I'm talking about literally, uh, spiritually, we are raised uh, with him in heaven. Then what is meaning and significance of being raised with Christ for us today? Being raised with Christ means that we belong to a new place. 
while we live on, on, on this earth, we're in Shawnee or anywhere else in, in this world, we are no longer creatures of only this world. We are not bound by what we can see, touch, and smell, or taste. That's not only now. We are now people of a greater heavenly realm, and we think and work and speak in spiritual categories. Now in Christ, we belong more to heaven and less to earth. That is what that text is saying. We are God's kingdom people, living on earth, but we are God's kingdom people. That's what this, this, this phrase, raised up with, with him, talks about. That means we are identified with him in his, not only in his resurrection, but also in his ascension. And the second part of verse 6 talks about that we are also identified with him in his session. We are identified with him in a session. Verse 6b. Let me read the whole verse. There we, and, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wow. That's amazing. We are sitting here in Shawnee. At the same time, we are sitting in heaven. Then Paul says in verse 6b, and seated us with him in heavenly places. The work of God's mercy is to sit us in heavenly places in Christ. That was also part of a redemption story and a redemption plan. Not only us save and just live them. Do the believers physically live on earth? And we are. I've been to uh, many more countries and many more places. But that's not important. What is important is that we are seated with him in heavenly places. Spiritually, uh, we are, uh, physically we are here, and spiritually we are sitting with Christ in heaven. The believer is of both places now. He belongs to two worlds. There's a great book by John Stott, though it's, it is about uh, preaching. Um, the title is uh, wonderful, Be Between Two Worlds. It's a, it's a wonderful book. We are, and I would say you, you are, and you have two addresses now. Again, I will say I had many addresses um, in Pakistan, India, Shawnee, or somewhere else. But literally, we have two addresses now. One in Shawnee and one in Christ, in heaven. And we maintain two relationships as well. One to earth and one to heaven. That is a tension in Reformed theology we talk about already, not yet. Though we are still on this earth or in this world today, that is our physical location. We are here in a two, two different and specific locations. But God who sees the end from beginning sees us in term, terms of our relationship with Christ Jesus. Where he is, we are. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. When he died, we died. When he arose, we arose. When he ascended, we ascended. And when he sat down on the right hand of God, we sat down on the right hand of God. Amazing fact. Now the purpose of our being exalted with Christ is not only for our own benefit or glory. God's greater purpose in salvation is for his own sake. He has seated us even in heaven. And we are seated there and we are thinking about our own glory and our purpose. 
that is unthinkable. Verse 7 says, So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. The work of God's mercy has been great purpose. To show believers the riches of his grace throughout all the ages to come. We know his grace, but there's much more to come. Much more to experience. Much more to praise. That's the purpose of God for his church. Reaches beyond itself. It reaches beyond itself. The church is to be the exhibition to the whole creation of the wisdom and love and great mercy of God in Christ. Therefore, dear God's people, if you are saved, you are a billboard upon which God writes his love for us, for the lost sinners. Your life is a testimony to his saving grace and power. So I would encourage you and urge you this morning, let us live like him, let us love like him, and let us labor like him in his kingdom. Let us do these things so that others might be drawn to him and that they might be saved. Because we are passed from the death and life of Jesus Christ. Let us praise him and let us glorify him. Let us testify him in this world. Let us pray. Father, thank you for all the marvelous truth we learned today. Thank you for your love that you have revealed to us in your own son through your own Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for the truth that you, you have sown into our hearts today, this morning. Watch over them and protect them. May they take root and produce wonderful things, things of beauty and great blessing to many others. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory in this age and forever. In Christ, gracious and glorious name I ask. Amen.